the fourth century BCE. Um, I can't see any of you at the moment because I have my, uh, my screen on full, but I invite somebody to unmute themselves and tell me what strikes them as odd about the number that we discovered, that were discovered on the Kyrenia ship, 29. Anybody? Is that 29 pairs or 29 individual objects? Uh-huh, it's 29 individual objects. Well, that's a very specific number. Well, it's a specific number. And when you look at the way that these millstones worked, it's in both senses of the Twenty-nine of them were found. This is um, the ship where the most of these sorts of mills have ever been found. The fact that twenty-nine were found tells us something that we never knew before, which was that you could buy them individually. You didn't have to buy a set. You could buy one at a time. So if you're broken, if your lower stone had broken into or gotten a crack, or your upper one, you could apparently just buy the the part that you needed. They were they were sold separate. They were separates. Were sold separately. <laughs> uh, shortly after the the fines were raised and uh, the and everything was was taken out into the town of Kyrenia, uh, Susan and Michael got in touch with uh, a young graduate student at the American School of Classical Studies in Athens who was studying stone artifacts, and that graduate student was Curtis Runnels. <laughs> and Curtis analyzed the stones from the Kyrenia ship back when he was a graduate student in the, in the early 1970s. And he determined that they came from the small, practically volcanic, that is almost completely volcanic island of Nisiros in the Eastern Mediterranean. You see Nisiros here on the map, some good distance away from Kyrenia. So some of the cargo of the ship came um, from, from Nisiros. Whoops, what happened here? Whoa, that wasn't right. I'm gonna, I don't know what happened there. Cause what you were, this picture can, can you guys see a picture? No, but we see it in the little thumbnail. Yeah. yeah. Well, when I ran through this before it was all working and this has never happened to me before, but what you can see in the little thumbnail are a bunch of amphoras on the bottom of the um, ocean floor. And then those same amphoras in the, uh, in the storerooms. Oh my goodness. Andrea, what? you can enlarge the thumbnail by sliding the boundary between the thumbnail and the main picture to the right. Right, I can, but I'm a little worried about what's happening with this entire presentation, which has never ever happened before. Can I try just quitting PowerPoint and reopening the file? All right, let's try that. Wow, that, that has never happened. Um, has that ever happened to any of you guys before? No. I've never seen that. No. All right. Okay, that was a little panicky. Um, so here are the amphoras on the ocean floor uh, with uh, one of the divers and here they are in the storeroom. This was the primary um, component of the uh, cargo of the ship. There were about 400 of these huge jars. The great majority of them, about 350, came from the island of Rhodes, and then another admixture, about 40 or so, came from the eastern Mediterranean island of Samos, and then a few other odds and ends, a few from Cyprus itself, and then a few other um, singletons from other spots in the eastern Mediterranean. So you're starting to get a sense of the buildup of the cargo in the ship from these various locales in the eastern Mediterranean. The amphoras were handy 
for something in addition to telling us about the cargo of the ship. And that has to do with the date. Because these amphoras, these large transport jars in, um, in the, that were made at various places in the Eastern Mediterranean, their handles, the tops of their handles here were stamped as this with the names of the magistrates of the year in the issuing on, on the island or the city that was the issuing authority. And there are archaeologists, I am not one of them, who study the details of the names and put them in order and figure out how to assign them to actual years. And we know that um, most of the amphoras on the Kyrenia ship were stamped in a four year period between around 294 and 290 BCE. And it's uh, very handy to have those stamps because they uh, provide additional confirmation to the other piece of dating evidence that we have from the ship and that's coins. There were only seven little bronze coins found by Susan and Michael and their crew when they were excavating. One of them was illegible. Four of them were small bronze issues in the name of um, Alexander, uh, oh, five of them were small bronze issues in the name of Alexander, not this one. This is a nice one from um, uh, a catalog. Uh, you can see the reference down there because the, <laughs> the ones from the Carmenia ship like those ingots are, they are very, very hard to see. So they, they don't look too attractive. Um, but this is a, a, an example of one that's exactly like those from Kyrenia. So they are, they were minted um, in the latter part of the fourth century BCE and they continued in circulation. And then the latest coin was a single bronze issue of Ptolemy I that was struck on Cyprus at the mint of Paphos uh, sometime between 295 and 285. So we get a date of around 290, give or take, BCE for the time that the ship sank. And that's interesting for all sorts of reasons, but one of the reasons it's interesting is because it's about 50 years later, apparently, than when the ship was built. The ship was um, lifted from the ocean floor and it now is uh, been reconstructed and in its own special room in Kyrenia Castle, Venetian Castle in the town of Kyrenia on Cyprus. And some of the timbers were, um, samples were taken for dendrochronological dating. And we have a very good um, set of records for the fifth and the fourth and the third centuries BCE uh, from, from dendrochronological labs. So we can get pretty close to the, the date and the ship was made of timber that was felled around 340 BCE, that's shortly after the middle of the fourth century BCE. Uh, one of the things that Michael and Susan did was uh, actually, uh, along with Andreas and, and, and other members of their team, was oversee the construction of a, um, a ship, uh, of a model, of, of a seafaring model. Um, a replica of the Kyrenia ship because they were very curious about how it was loaded. 400 amphoras is a lot of amphoras along with 29 millstones and 10,000 almonds and oak logs and silver ingots, uh, bronze ingots, or iron ingots. <laughs> I'm getting the metal right here. And um, you see here in this, uh, this cutaway reconstruction drawing of the way that amphoras were loaded onto ships in antiquity. They were stacked one above the others. This is one of the reasons actually that they have the shape that they do so that they could kind of nest. As you can see here in this little drawing on the right, um, one of them could nest nicely into another and there were rows of them. But one of the things that Susan and Michael discovered when they, in addition to uh, making, uh, creating a replica of the Kyrenia, called the Kyrenia II, they commissioned a potter to make replicas of the amphoras, same size, right scale, and tried to load the ship. And they actually couldn't do it initially. They couldn't get all the amphoras on the ship, what I've just drawn a circle around, are extra amphoras that were on land. Um, and when they went back along with Dick Steffi, who was the person who studied 
the construction of the ship particularly, they figured out that there had been additional planking to raise the size of the cargo hold of the ship at some point in the past. So it wasn't part of its original construction. And that is a point that we will come back to at the very end of this talk. So at the time that the ship was built, this was the political overlay of the region. It was largely under the control of the Achaemenid Persians and imperial power. Uh, no sound, Audrey. And into region had changed dramatically to the world post Alexander. So after Alexander's conquered the Achaemenid Persians, and then upon his early death, the entirety of this region uh, was divvied up by his general Yeah, we're getting some freeze moments. Andrea, can you hear us? I'm uh, not sure what's happening. Pardon me? Uh, we, we, you, uh, occasionally you freeze and we don't hear you. Oh dear, I'm so sorry. Hmm. Um, you last froze when you were talking about um, the previous slide. Yeah, oh. the, the Achaemenid. Uh, empire, you started to introduce it, and then and then you've been mostly frozen since. Oh gosh, I'm uh, sorry. All right, let's go. Let's. So you saw the slide with the Achaemenids. You saw the. Yes. Okay. Um, so then, uh, Alexander the Great conquers the Achaemenid kingdom, and then he dies young and. The entirety of that, um, what they had been in charge of is divvied up by his generals. So Ptolemy takes over Egypt and the southern and central part of the Levant, Cyprus, portions of southern and coastal Turkey. Seleucus takes over this whole vast region and some portions um, of the Eastern Mediterranean state independent, like for example, the island of Rhodes. So by the time that the Kyrenia ship sinks, uh, there are a whole variety of political entities in charge throughout this region. So that is what we know about the ship and that is what we know <laughs> about the cargo. And that is what uh, Michael and Susan and their colleagues studied for many, many years. So why was it that Susan was calling me um, on a winter's day in 2014 in Boston? Because there were still 109 vessels unaccounted for in the study of the ship. And those 109 vessels were the simple goods of its small crew. What was there? There was a very handsome little array of matching vessels. There were four small plates, four large plates, four small bowls, four large bowls, four tiny bowls, four drinking cups, four wine cruets, and four oil cruets, along with four wooden spoons. So I guess there was a crew of four on the ship. And every single member of the crew had a very complete 
matched set of dishes. Every member had his own wine cruet, his own oil cruet, his own drinking cup, his own set of plates, his own set of bowls. And every crew member had the same thing. They all had the exact same, same size, same number, as, as if to say the members of the crew were a unit working together. The cap, there was no special um, uh, separate items for the captain. Uh, all four members had the exact same, uh, same array. In addition, uh, the items of the crew's kit were kind of clever in the way that they worked together. So you can see that the small bowl and the small plates stack inside their larger cousins. But in addition, the small plate fits neatly over the small bowl and the large plate fits neatly over the large bowl, which would help if you are eating on board and the boat gets a little sloshy. It would help if you want to keep whatever you have in your dish warm. It would help if you want to keep um, things from falling into your food or, or insects from flying into your food. So it was a pretty clever arrangement. They had uh, at each meal about 10 ounces of wine that was allocated to them. And I figured out something kind of fun about the allocation. So some of you may know that um, in this part of the world in antiquity, people did not drink their wine straight. They always mixed it with water. And I figured out that when you poured half of the volume of the wine cruet into the cup, uh, it filled exactly the cup up to the break, uh, not the break, but the, uh, but the bend in the body before it moved up to its neck. You know, this is a sort of a strange shape actually for a vessel, but it's a handy shape if what you want is an easy indicator of how far to pour your wine so that you can fill the rest of your cup with water, which makes me wonder if the whole origin of this shape, which nobody has ever really discussed, um, is exactly for that reason. In addition, uh, each crew member had about one and a quarter cups of oil at each individual um, meal allocation, which seems like a kind of shocking amount of olive oil at a single meal. Uh, you have to imagine that they would have had bread. And um, I mean, I think we can all agree that olive oil on bread is very delicious, but um, happily it's also rather filling because for many of the meals, this would have been uh, the chief bulk item that a crew member would have had. But also on the, um, uh, on the ship, the seeds and, uh, and, and um, other stem pieces of lots of other foodstuffs tell us uh, other things that the, that the men had on board. So they had olives and grapes, which everybody could have guessed from this part of the world, but they also had garlic and pistachios and figs and pomegranates and millet. Um, remnants of all of these uh, have, were found when Susan and Michael and their team were excavating. And I love that because in addition to the lovely matched set of dishes that every single crew member had, the array of food stuff, um, the nice amount of wine that each person could have at meal, makes me think that the life of a crew member on the Kyrenia ship was much, much nicer than uh, the life of a crew member, for example, of uh, a British mariner in the 18th or early 19th century as this um, sad painting displays these four guys shoveling it down uh, below decks. Our crew members on the Kyrenia ship had it much nicer in addition to the fact that they um, uh, probably set an actual table, whether that was on board or in the harbor at night uh, in addition to their full panoply of table settings that each person had, they had serving vessels as well. So you can imagine the men sitting around with a group presentation with serving two serving bowls, a large um, crater, a big large bowl that, uh, that could have held um, some group meal, two pitchers, perhaps this one with black glaze for wine and this one for water that would have been poured into the wine cruets. 
and uh, dishes for, for preparation, a wooden mallet and uh, a mortar, a ladle, large pitchers for carrying water. Uh, so they were well fitted out both to prepare nice meals and to serve and have nice meals. Um, they would have kept water on board. There were two very, very large water vessels, water jars. They're about two feet high, so they're pretty capacious. Only one of them got put back together. It took so long uh, to put the one of them back together <laughs> that the other one just remains um, all in its fragments in the Kyrenia storeroom. They had a couple cooking vessels, not um, uh, or or metal vessels, I should say. And here you see one of them as it was found under the planking of the boat. And then as it was recovered, this is a bronze, a big bronze cauldron. Its ring handles would have allowed a, uh, a wooden a wooden dowel to uh, or, or, or stick to be put through here. And then this could have been um, secured to, to hang over a fire. And this was actually probably for boiling water, which of course would have only been done on land. And they also had two little iron grills. And you see here a reconstruction of what um, one of the grills looked like, but we have the iron pieces of uh, two of these small grills uh, so that they could have had their sublaki uh, um, over some charcoal fire uh, along with everything else. And they also had ceramic cooking vessels, four of them, uh, and you see them mostly in pieces here. And one of the things that's interesting about the ceramic cooking vessels, the cooking pots, is that they had these cooking pots, four cooking pots, and they had lids, that's what's up here in the upper left, but the lids really fit a different kind of pot. They fit a kind of pot of the sort that I've just put on the screen and fragments of a cooking pot like that weren't found in the Kyrenia ship, only these other smaller um, mouthed cooking pots. So I suppose that originally when the ship set out in its original form, they had cooking vessels of this sort, which we call casseroles, but they broke. So the casseroles were tossed overboard. We don't have any remnants of them, but the lids still worked. So the crew kept the lids and they just acquired additional cooking pots as they went along their journey. In the fragments, in these 109 fragments that were found in the ship's um, along with the ship's pottery was a category of um, remains that in maritime archaeology is called bilge. Bilge is a funny term, but a specific term. It means fragments that fell, that were broken, that were garbage. Bilge is garbage that is still on the ship. And in the case of the Kyrenia ship, the bilge consisted of fragments of earlier vessels, fragments of pottery that had belonged to the crew on earlier voyages broke. Probably most of the vessel was thrown overboard, but a piece that broke, if it broke in your hand, it would have fallen through the planking of the deck. It would have fallen down into the bottom of the hold. It would have just rested all the way down there, nestled among the amphoras or the rest of the cargo. It would not have been worth it to get it out. And so these tiny fragments of bilge were left for us to find, for people to find when, the, when uh, the ship was excavated all these years later. And the bilge turns out to have quite a bit to tell us. Uh, both the bilge and, the, um, and some of the larger vessels were tested in lots of analytical ways in order to try to determine where the pottery came from because the cargo is one thing, but where the goods of the crew came from, that's gonna help us learn where the crew came from, where the crew themselves might've come from. Because of course, either they would bring their own or they would commission the kinds of goods that would serve their own purposes, you, you might suppose. So um, Susan and Michael were very curious to know where the pottery was made. They took lots of 
um, samples for clay analysis, neutron activation, chemical that is elemental analysis. And they also did petrography. Um, they also uh, commissioned somebody to do petrography, Yuval Goran of the Israel Antiquities Authority. And between the petrography and the neutron activation analysis, we got a lot of confusing results. So for example, uh, according to two different neutron activation anal analytical studies, one from the Missouri University Research Reactor in Columbia, Missouri, and one from Brooklyn Lab, uh, the main dishes of the last set of the crew came either from Athens or from Rhodes. Uh, Brookhaven thought that this dish came from Alexandria, Egypt. The people at Mur thought it came from Cyprus. And according to petrography, it came from someplace in the Aegean. This cookingware lid, according to Mur, came from Cyprus. Uh, according to Brookhaven, came from someplace in Western Anatolia. And according to petrography, it came from Rhodes. Uh, so I was left to try to make some sense of all of these analytical results and also to combine them with the most tried and true. <laughs> Have I frozen again? No, you're fine. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the most tried and true mode in the um, arsenal of uh, ceramicists, which is simply close comparison with where other forms of this precise type, other wares of this precise type, other slips of this precise type have been found in abundance. And what I discovered was that all of the cooking vessels that belonged to the bilge, that is the first earlier round of cooking vessels, all of the table vessels that belong to the bilge, and all of the table vessels that belong to the final goods of the crew were only well paralleled on the island of Rhodes, which did not make any of this sort of pottery for export. They did not make uh, cooking vessels and table vessels for export. And so because both the first and the second round of the ship's goods um, are very well paralleled at Rhodes, uh, to say nothing of the 400 transport amphoras that were on board the ship that all came from Rhodes, I think that the port from which the ship sailed and from whence the crew came was actually the island of Rhodes. All right. So here we are on the island of Rhodes. And now let's see what we can see about the route of the ship. The bilge helps us know where it set out for in the first place. So its initial um, cooking vessels and its initial table vessels tells us that there was an earlier round for the Kyrenia ship. It left the island of Rhodes, let's say around uh, 295, 294 or so. And, um, hmm, why did that happen? Ah, and um, then the crew moved around the Mediterranean. How do I know that they moved around the Eastern Mediterranean and down its coast? Because the cooking vessels, the great big water jars and a few other odds and ends like this um, little sort of sieve vessel are very, very well paralleled and actually petrographically identified as coming also from these sites along the Levantine coast. So we can imagine our crew leaving roads sometime around 295, 294, sailing through uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, picking up Maybe they lost one of their casserole dishes someplace in here. Uh, so they pick up one of their cooking pots, another cooking pot, a third cooking pot. Um, they pick up a couple water jars. Uh, they go to Alexandria. They end up um, on Cyprus where they pick up their fourth cooking pot and they make it back to Rhodes, having by this time lost uh, enough of their first set of table vessels 
that they need to restock. So they restock with the table vessels that we have just seen. They load up with amphoras and grinding stones brought to roads by smaller um, steamers coming from other places in the Eastern Mediterranean, the Samian amphoras, the Nisiros grinding stones, and they set sail again only to come to a tragic end off the north coast of Cyprus sometime around 290. Said at the beginning that uh, a kind of theme for me, one of the themes for me of the story of the Kyrenia ship is beginnings. And everything that I've just told you embedded a lot of beginnings and we have one more or perhaps even a few more because inside the assemblage of bilge, there were a few other vessels that didn't match any of the ones that had come before. These other vessels were fragments of drinking cups of the sort that you see here, and a couple fragments of jars of the sort that you see here that date typologically to the fifth and the fourth centuries BCE. After the end of the fourth century BCE, vessels of this sort are not made anywhere anymore. The places that these vessels are at home are the Eastern Mediterranean shores, the Southern coast of Turkey, the Eastern Mediterranean shores of the Levantine coast and down towards Egypt. That's where cups of this sort and jars of this sort were, were very, very popular, were very, very common throughout this time. And you may remember, that actually the ship also dates to this time. The ship was built in the latter part of the fourth century BCE. So it looks like the ship started its life someplace along the Levantine coast and its earliest crews used drinking cups of this sort, carried goods and jars of this sort, And yet our ship ended up becoming an amphora steamer departing from Rhodes on at least two voyages in the early part of the third century BCE. How did that happen? That takes us to almost the last beginning of the story of the ship. Alexander the Great dies in 323. And as I said earlier, his generals fight over his territory. They fight to um, grab as much of it as they can. One of those generals was Antigonus and his extremely ambitious son, Demetrius Polyorcetes. Uh, Antigonus controlled a huge portion of Turkey and parts of, uh, of the northern part of the Levant and Cyprus. And uh, they wanted to challenge the hold of Ptolemy and they wanted to um, gain a good footing for conducting a naval battle. And so Demetrius decided to try to take over control of the island of Rhodes. In the year 305 BCE, Demetrius began an assault on the island. In preparation for that assault, he built uh, a huge, huge siege machine. And in order to um, supply his men and in order to uh, keep a maritime blockade to keep uh, enemy ships out, we know from the ancient historian Diodorus Siculus that Demetrius ordered about three, about a thousand privately owned ships 
which belonged to those who were engaged in trade. And he got those ships by coming through the area of the Levant, the area that is, was known in antiquity as Coli Syria. Those ships would have helped support the blockade of, um, of the island and the siege was uh, to, be, to be conducted from this enormous, enormous device called the Helopolis, uh, which, which Demetrius built. And uh, it was this, which is huge thing made out of bronze and uh, wood. Uh, but despite his best efforts uh, and a year long siege, Demetrius was unable to, to take the island of Rhodes. It did not succumb. And uh, the Helopolis uh, just was left to, to rot uh, in, near the harbor of Rhodes and Demetrius himself um, eventually also bites the dust. Around 290 BCE, the Rhodians, very flush and proud of themselves, decide to repurpose the metal of the Helopolis of Demetrius. And they commission a local sculptor, Caris of Lindos, to build one of the great wonders of the ancient world the Colossus of Rhodes. The construction of the Colossus of Rhodes started around 294 BCE. That means that on its first voyage and on its final voyage through the, through the harbor, our four men would have traveled beneath and past the footings of this Colossus that was rising. You can imagine their last view of the island of Rhodes as they left the harbor, looking back at the, this great feat of uh, ancient sculpture that was rising above them. I've said throughout this talk that uh, one of the themes for me of the Kyrenia ship is beginnings, but I think at the heart, for me, the main theme of the Kyrenia ship is actually people the people who found it, the people who worked on it, uh, all of the people who have studied it. And for me, the people who made the Kyrenia ship work the way it did in antiquity, because the record that we have about Rhodes in the year 290 is all about the Colossus that was rising. That's what an ancient author was interested in. And that's what ancient historians were interested in. But as archeologists, we're pretty interested in the people themselves. And for me, the most beautiful coda of the Kyrenia ship is that at the same time that the Colossus was rising, we now can see the men of its crew rising to greet us even more vividly than the Colossus ever could. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Um, Catherine, are you still here? I'm still here. Oh, great. I know that you have to leave, possibly. But um, I know that all of us are, are I, I'm just entranced with the stories and also with the possible um, linkages to all kinds of other way of life things. I, I'm interested in food anthropology. So of course, when you showed the millstones, I got all excited by uh, <laughs> the, the craft of food and what they were grinding. I guess it was millet or? Uh, uh, it could have been millet, could have been wheat. Yeah. Probably wheat. Do you know the work of Rachel Loudon? She's mm -hmm. a food historian who is currently on a big project to study all the ways of grinding and pounding that have ever existed. Wow. She, yeah, yeah, she's she's really quite extraordinary. But I might introduce her to you if that's all right. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That would be and, great. You know, the other the other ideas about the usages of these tools, the, the human uses, um, um are really fascinating. When you look at the route that you've traced, the voyages, 
and the you know, the ways in which they supplemented or you know replaced their vessels, their utensils, and you think, well, you know, there must have been a fairly homogeneous diet available through all those ports. It must the must the utensils must have resembled each other enough so that the diet wouldn't seem very strange, that, that it would be. Um, you know, that's interesting. So I um, actually, the <coughs> foodstuffs themselves, uh, Eastern Mediterranean geography, climate um, and agriculture being relatively consistent in the coastal zones anyway, the ingredients, would have been similar, but the preparations were likely very different. And the reason we know that is because the shapes of the cooking vessels are different. Yeah, yeah. and techniques would have been different then. Probably so. I mean, in the same way that you can take the same six ingredients and you can make a quesadilla or you can make a pizza or you can make mushu, um, all with the same ingredients. So uh, it, it will have been the, the, the recipes and the preparations that would have um, differentiated. And I think that one of the things that I love a lot about, um, about the vessels on the ship is the, the men came from Rhodes. Rhodes is culturally, linguistically, and certainly Greek. The cooking vessels they end up with are Levantine. They started out with Greek style cooking vessels. They don't replace them. Those Levantine cooking vessels work just fine for them. When I think about who they were, if I would have to think about assigning them some kind of cultural moniker, yeah. I would say maritime. <laughs> they were very open. They were people of the sea. Yeah, that's fascinating. Catherine, I, I know that you would, um, you can jump in here if you want. I'm gonna... Actually, Andrea just asked, answered my question. My question was going to be, if you could assign them to a place and a culture on this broad region, where would you assign them? But you have assigned them a new sort of cultural group on your own. But presumably speaking Greek. Well, you know, I, I think, I mean, it is very interesting, isn't it? How we're interested in that question. <laughs> and it's very interesting how we seek a kind of single answer. And one um, of the common things that we do in uh, archaeology, especially when, we, as, when we're looking at anything from a long ago past, is we ask who they were, but we seek this kind of flattened box, little, you know, can put it in a file folder, on a file folder label response. And sometimes all the aspects of somebody's lifestyle are consistent. Their language and the artistic styles that they live around and the architectural styles and the gods. And it's not so hard to put a label. Um, one of the things that I realized when I was studying the goods of the crew was I couldn't label them. There were so many different, they were such magpies and I thought about sailors. I thought about that entire world. They are their own community in so many ways. And so if I, well, I did have to give them a label because I had to write about them or I got to write about them and that's the label I gave them in the end. I didn't call them Greek. I said, would they have called themselves Greek? I'm not sure, but they would have certainly called themselves sailors. Joanna. Hi, I, I have a, a question that's less about the um, kind of particular category, um, identity, et cetera, that, that you might have to puzzle out and, you know, in some ways rename um, or resituate in terms of who these people were and more, a more kind of question and formulation about the very last thing that you said about this being Yes, a, a, a lovely kind of um, narrative about different kinds of beginnings, but ultimately about people. And it just made me think about this, about you being here today, right? We're a Department of Anthropology. We are one, uh, a, a Department of Anthropology that's trying to 
think through what the incorporation is of archaeology in other than the particular people who we love who have come into this world like where what are we what are we um thinking about in terms of common questions in our sort of search for this understanding of people broadly and and I, so so i wanted to maybe ask a question that brings together another kind of beginnings which is the i think the first conversation that you and i ever had um <laughs> that you said you know what the the the, um, what archaeology has to get over is its own um, sort of, I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing you, is it's like kind of um, uh, resting on the value of its wow factor. Like, look at all this, it's cool factor, I think you called it. Like, we have to get beyond, all, like, isn't this cool? And really say what this is about. Yeah. And it seems to me what you've said it's about is your relationship, right, to a set of, to a kind of a cast of characters across a huge span of time that then you can bring to bear in telling us something about what it means to be human at this point in time, but not just at that point in time, right? All along the way. So here's, here's the kind of question in that, which is cultural anthropologists have a really um, fraught kind of history with how we relate to the people <laughs> that we're trying to understand, right? There's all these sort of moments in which the lines of, you know, researcher to subject, friend, family, all these things, like they get really blurry because they're living <laughs> when we talk to them. Right. And it's often a long period of time in our own lives and theirs that we develop these relationships, right? And, that's, and, and we're always wrestling with that. Like, how do we understand what our relationship is, right, to the people that we're most interested in understanding and in kind of representing in these different ways of the world? You're doing that, but with people, obviously, mostly who, <laughs> Uh, you can just sort of say, look at these great people. Let me show you how wonderful they are. <laughs> and I, and you can kind of, you can determine what your own relationship is with them in a way that they don't get to speak back to you about that. So can you talk a little bit about how you imagine yourself into those relationships and how you kind of think through what your relationship is to these people as people, right? And why you can say at the end, like what I really want to tell you about what this is really about is the people, like what that actually means in terms of your relationship with them. One of the things that I think a lot about when I, so I, so, so the main way that I get to these people and to the past um, over my career has been through ceramics. And usually ceramics are very mundane. They are very banal. They are very individual. They must be functional. They have to work. They reflect the most elemental of activities and sometimes some of the most precious activities, uh, a family dinner, a celebratory meal, what you give to somebody when they are sent into the afterlife, um, an offering in a, in a sanctuary. So, so ceramics, when I hold them in my hand, I am practically holding hands with the person who used it in the past. And I think I cannot help but think of them as agents of their own worth and their own activity. They come to life in that way. And then because I work in a sphere of the world, the, the Near East um, and the Eastern Mediterranean, which is um, a political cataclysm, was then is now, but you know, is just nonstop. I'm pretty fascinated with these two levels. So I so I get this, I get all of these people because I'm holding their material in my hand. But these people are living in a big and complicated world with a lot of political tumult washing over their heads. Like us. Like like everybody who lives in a complex society. We all sometimes are, are bound by the politics and the boundaries and the conflicts and the coalitions and the trading partners and the cultural language. And sometimes we aren't. Sometimes we are just living our lives. And I'm really interested in when these two strata collapse, when the one impinges on the other, when the one just goes its way. And one of the things that I love about the Kyrenia ship is that little boat 
and its crews lived through some of the most tumultuous political upheavals in the Eastern Mediterranean ever. And it plied its route no matter what. People had that kind of freedom and that kind of agency. Um, I'm sure it was not a big shipping concern. I'm sure it was a family. The reason I'm sure it was a family is because of the equality of the sets, the lovely sets, not you know just a couple of dishes or helter skelter. Even when they went back to restock, they restocked full sets, matching sets for all four of them. These were people who were agents of their own fate in a time when we just don't get to see that. And that's how, and so. Andrea, um, two questions. I take it everybody got off the ship. There were no skeletons found in the wreck? Everybody got off the ship and that is common. Unless it's sunk, unless it sinks in really, really, really deep water, they had dinghies. Yeah, or a storm, yeah. yeah. Second question, uh, you showed a picture of the Colossus um, straddling a, uh, a, a boat channel. Uh, the things I've read about, about ancient engineering suggest that that was a myth perpetrated in the Middle Ages and that the Colossus was actually a single bronze shell around a, a central marble column, probably, not, uh, not built straddling a, a boat channel. Is that true? Well, we don't really know. Um, because we don't really know. It is, it is very, very, so that is, um, I, I mean, an earlier, one of the slides there showed um, that exit out of the harbor, the modern harbor at Rhodes. It's extremely unlikely that uh, a, a statue could have truly straddled that harbor. That's what I thought, okay. But Matthew, it makes such a great image for our little boat to sail there. <laughs> to sail through there. <laughs> so that's why I used it. <laughs> Robert, hi. Hi, uh, that was great. So the, the maritime people that I know anything about and I don't know much are the ones who were plying the Taiwan Strait between Taiwan and mainland China and Southeast Asia and Japan. And those people were fishermen and they were traders and they were smugglers and they were pirates. And it was often the same people were all of those in rotation or simultaneously. And especially because your ship appears to have been retrofitted at one point, right? To accommodate more cargo. Yep. It sounds like a kind of mixed history to the ship. So first, is there even, is smuggling a thing at that time, is there any evidence of it? And then what about other possible uses of the ship? So, so um, smuggling, I, I mean, I would hesitate to say uh, that any kind of nefarious um, action that somebody could apply for personal gain was not a thing in, at any place in time. Um, that said, uh, smuggling, uh, Harbors made their money, and, and cities made their cities with harbors made their money by by harbor tolls, and it is hard to believe that people didn't try to figure out how to get around that. So I'm sure that smuggling was a thing, um, but but it, it, there are not if it, you have to have a pretty small ship to be able to get into like a tiny little bay. Um, but you know, I mean, it's a watery area with a lot, it's, it, it's, it's just like the zone that you know, and, and there will have been opportunity for smuggling. Also, we know, and this we know for absolute certain, there was piracy. Um, and in fact, there was piracy, pirates in this time um, and for a few hundred years were very, very lodged. There was sort of like a pirate kingdom practically in Cilicia which is uh, the zone along the Southern coast of Turkey, which is opposite Kyrenia. And there were some theories early on um, that that's what brought down the Kyrenia ship, that it was attacked by pirates because a couple spearheads were found on board. Um, but the spearheads could have been for the crew. You know, they, the, the crew could have used them for hunting when they were on land. They could have used them for protection. 
So we don't know whose spearheads they were. Um, but one of the early theories uh, that Michael wondered about was that the Kyrenia ship was attacked by pirates. So that did exist. Can, can I ask a question that yeah. follows on, on that? So what did sink the ship? Well, we don't know what sunk the ship. We don't know, but the ship was in such fantastic condition. It's, it's something like, it's still the best preserved ancient Greek ship ever found. It, it, it's something like 75 or 80% preserved. So it's, we have a lot of it. Um, and there's no damage to it. It just sort of went down. So, uh, and it was facing, a, uh, it was facing um, towards Cyprus, towards Kyrenia. So either it was not do any damage or it went down in a little squall and, you know, it just sort of turned around and then went, and it was trying to get back to, to port. And can I ask a follow-up question that's rooted totally in ignorance? So I was going to ask if they were a family because of the egalitarian part, but I, so I know nothing. I know no pirates, smugglers, shippers of any kind, but um, everything that I've read in novels usually suggests that it's a pretty hierarchical affair, that everybody has to have a kind of designated role on a ship. So what would it, what would the, the jobs on the ship have looked like? Do you have any idea what people yeah. were doing on the ship? So um, that is that's that that is a great question, um, which uh, I might not be able to answer, except for an interesting experience that I had about I don't know nine years or so ago, when I led a kind of little I just did this once in my life I led this little luxury tour called In the Footsteps of Alexander, and it was this three week tour where we we traced the entire first year of Alexander's campaign. And so we started at Troy where Alexander comes ashore and we ended um, at Issus uh, near modern day Antakya. So one of the things that Alexander um, did was he sailed around the bottom of Lycia. He had, he sent our armed troops across, but he sailed. So we did too, we spent a week on a little boat that was about the size of the Kyrenia ship and it had a crew of four. One of the crew was the captain. One of the crew was the cook. One of the crew did the laundry every day. And I can't remember what the special other thing that the fourth person did, but all four of them manned the ship. When we would come into port, when we would come out of port, when the sails went up, when the sails went down. So only the captain steered, but these four people worked like a single unit together. And you would think the Kyrenia ship was 47 feet long. And that's about how long this boat was too that we were on. And it was a little complicated, but four people, it, you didn't need more than four. One of the things that we know about um, maritime trade in the Eastern Mediterranean in this period is that there were two levels. One were consortia. There, you know, in the same way that um, early colonial America trade work, where there were wealthy people who commissioned a boat and they hired a captain and the captain hired a crew. And then they all went out, you know, and they went to the West Indies and got silk or whatever it was that they did. Um, and there were commissioned hierarchical crews and ships in the Eastern Mediterranean at this time as well. We have a lot of literary evidence about them. And then there were families, there were little family concerns. And we, I think of all of the things on the Kyrenia ship, that those dishes tell me, they tell me this was a family. I have one last question, I'm gonna shut up. All men or men and women? I suppose it was men. I mean, we, about this, we have no evidence, we only just, have what we know or pres presume about this time and place. And no children on board is presumably, no. Well, if they did, they didn't have their own cup and saucer. Right. <laughs> um, I have a question about, back to piracy again. Oh, boy, this is fascinating stuff. Um, 
what would have been the object of piracy that what was the cargo that was you know ready to be looted or what is what was the precious thing that was in <laughs> trade or on these ships that would have been sought by probably, pirates probably not millstones <laughs> probably not millstones or you know a single large heavy amphora <laughs> <laughs> with wine. And this is one of the reasons that we, uh, most of us who are, you know, part of the, the big modern Kyrenia crew, all of us who are studying the various parts of the, of the ship and its goods, don't think anymore that it was piracy. They would have been able to see, this is a small ship, we're not going to find very much. But shipwrecks have been found with lots of loot in them. And by loot, I just mean the kind of cool stuff that I was telling Joanna about all those times ago. Cool stuff, rich stuff, precious stuff, luxury. And that had to be what the pirates were going after. Not money. Money is almost never found out. It's not bullion. Um, you know, sometimes people ask me what, why were not more coins found? The crew just had small change. They had little bronzes. This would not have been worth a pirate's while. But, but, but fancy stuff, silver vessels, um, glass. Well, glass wasn't made in um, mass quantities at this time yet. So it wouldn't have, at this time, it wouldn't have been glass. But, but, but metal, maybe the ingots. Any other questions, uh, comments? Kimberly. I have one more stupid question. What did they do with the iron ingots? Did they melt them down? Was it for smelting or did they do something else with them? It was, okay. Raw material, like the oak timbers, raw material. There are, there are I mean, ships often were the best conveyors for big, heavy raw material um, from the, uh, fifth, late fifth, early fourth century BC in, a, in an area not, well, um, in an area near Bodrum in modern day Turkey was a shipwreck found with marble architectural elements, like pieces of a temple. <laughs> it's called the column wreck <laughs> or pieces of columns um, because marble was only in so many places, but you know, every town needs its own temple. So, and th those things are heavy. So what's the easiest way to crate them was by ship. So so back to the coins. So that so there weren't that many coins. And so that means that they were, you know, again, more evidence, small family, small change, not a not a whole big deal. So I guess this question is like, how do you how do you come to know what you know? Because this this is, you know, some a, a ship that's found. How, I'm not even going to do the, the the math here because that's beyond me. However many, <laughs> however however long after it's a while ago, a while ago, um, you know, by a, a sponge diver who who I'm guessing wasn't the first really who have maybe the first to tell anyone about it, but like maybe not the first to kind of encounter this thing. How do you so so all, all kinds of other possibilities of you know you talk about beginnings. There's also sort of middles right of like maybe a whole bunch of people, you know, just stopped by and took off the coins or well, like, maybe, maybe, but, but I, I get, I don't, I'm not doubting that you know that, but like, how do you rule out all of the other possibilities that happened in that interval? That so that, so else? that is actually archaeology. So the the Kyrenia ship was actually excavated. It was gridded, and we know I have in in the big chapter that I wrote, I have the exact location of every fragment. And it was not only gridded, it was excavated in layers. Now, often when you excavate a shipwreck, the layers are essentially arbitrary, like, okay, it's been underwater for 2000 years, things will have moved around. But in the case of the Kyrenia ship, we can tell that wasn't true. I mean, and you saw some of the photographs of the amphoras uh, down below, you can tell if something's been moved around. You can tell if something is out of place and they were not. Um, you saw the, the bronze cauldron smashed under the timbers. That's how it was recovered. 
So the coins were under, if coins would have been loose and easy to pocket, the coins would have floated away. Uh, and they and they didn't. The fact that we have so much of what we have that was found, you know, pretty cheek by jowl and it had to be individually disarticulated is the best clue that there wasn't that many middles, <laughs> if, if any. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> any, any other comments? I, this is such rich stuff. I love it. And I, I think Joanna's right. This is the, the point of intersect for us. This is what brings us together. Anthropology and archaeology is these questions and this sort of taking apart or and and then reweaving all the strands is really uh, boy is it fun and you've given us something on a uh, <laughs> otherwise gloomy Friday well it's not that gloomy but um, it's been it's been just wonderful and I hope to be in touch with you and actually meet you um, that would be lovely <laughs> yes let's do that um, so everyone thanks so much for for coming and we've got another uh, talk coming up in early December, um, Noah Rushdie's Mimicry and Production of Elite Masculinities in an International School in Egypt. So roughly the same region, but a very different topic. Um, and um, everybody uh, stay well. And thank you, Andrea. Then thank you, Catherine, for organizing it. Thank you. Thank you all. It's been fun. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you so much.